Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Welcome everybody. I'm George the Antique Nomad. Welcome to my haul and eBay listings. The items that are going to be shown tonight will all be listing on eBay and they will be available for sale. I think the first one we'll do is this little piece here. This little gal she is fantastic to me. She is Lucite and she's a pin. It looks kind of alien. I keep saying she, but this was a line called Victims of Fashion. You can see the pin on the back. These were made during the Second World War. And the reason they were made is because uh, they started in 1942. A company called Elzac in Los Angeles was involved. Interesting thing about Elzac, the people who were involved with Elzac were the same people who were the L part of Mattel. They ended up being toy makers and the same people who invented this pin in World War II invented the Barbie doll. They did the ceramics on Lucite. They were called victims of fashion. And a lot of them are really decorated heavily. They'll have sort of a Carmen Miranda type aspect to a lot of them where they're piled high with ceramic fruit or other applied pieces. But this was something that was done during the war because they could not get rhinestones from Austria. And we ran out of rhinestones pretty quickly. And so jewelry stopped using them. So they started using wood, lucite, ceramic, anything they could think of that they thought would help people to decorate themselves. I thought she was really neat. Um, this is one of the ones that is actually at fixed price, but um, offers are acceptable as well. Uh, the price these usually run for is around 125 and we will see what happens with her. There's also, okay, let's see, our next piece here. This is something I got out Mount Dora. It's brand new to my merchandise, and this might be a gift for dad, or, well, if mom approves. Anyway, this is Playboy, but when you open it up, it's nothing that you have to be worried about around your grandchildren, your dog, or your religious aunt. Because it's a bar tool set. Well, maybe your religious aunt wouldn't like it. But it is a bar tool set. These were made out of stainless steel in Japan. And these are from the 1970s. And they say Playboy bar set, uh, four-piece stainless steel. They made this style. They also made them with the rabbit on them. And this one doesn't look like it's been used very much. I think this was the sort of thing that you bought when you went to the Playboy Club or you got it as a premium for ordering a magazine subscription. Uh, this was back when people lied and said they read Playboy for the articles. Nowadays, people do read Playboy for the articles because they don't do any of the other naughty things that they used to do. Playboy is turned into a different kind of magazine. I guess that's what happens when you have daughters. His daughters took over and were like, yeah, no, we're done with that. Um, anyhow, this is a fun piece. I think that I have it. This one's opening at $9.99, and they usually sell in the $20 to $25 range, and I figured that with Christmas coming, that might be a gift for somebody. I also wanted to mention, um, just real quickly, the last time that we did this, I, I'm not going to go back and talk about all the items that sold, but I did want to show the big winner last time was this one. I have a printout because I didn't have time to get it to where I could just show you on the screen. But this plate, this New York World's Fair 1939 plate, ended up selling for over $200. I was quite surprised at... It turned out that it was because it had the gold backing on it, and the gold backing makes it unusual because Misty at Thrifter Junker Vintage Hunter had just sold the same piece, and I think she got 89 I've sold them before in that same price range, but this one apparently was a variation, which I did not know. And so I learned something from that. If it's got the big gold cartouche on the back, that makes it more special. So somebody was excited about that. 
let's see. So I would like to show you the next item that's going to be dropping. This is a Santa Claus with a thermometer painted on a shot glass. This is a bar measure or a jigger. And this is 1950s. And if you see in the bottom, it says Gay Fad. And Gay Fad was a company out of Columbus, Ohio. And they would buy glass from Libby up in Toledo and other companies and would actually paint it themselves with various designs. So they bought this as a blank and then they did the screen painting on them. They also painted fruit on Pyrex dishes. Decorating other people's glass was what they did for a uh, living, and that studio was very popular in the 50s. This is Santa Claus. Here's how. I just think he's really fun, and I believe that he's starting at $4.99, and they'll probably sell for $10 or $12, but it was just fun to do something for the holidays. This piece, which was the Scotty Dog bookends from Texaco, only sold for $15 plus shipping. So you win some and you lose some, and eBay is a learning experience. One thing that I've learned is that Auctions on eBay, if you have something very unusual like that other plate, auctioning is a great idea. And you really don't know until you try sometimes. In the other case, sometimes auctioning, you just don't hit that person. This is a fairly scarce piece and I would have thought would go for more, but somebody got a really good deal and they were happy. So we live and learn in this business and that's one of those situations. The compact. This is Alaska. And this would have come out about the time of statehood in 1959. It's by a company called Wadsworth. You can see with the box here, it is completely original mint in box and has never been used. The velvet box is in perfect shape. It's got its little liner there. I got this on the way here in Kansas and I bought it thinking, well, gee, I usually don't buy my Alaskan stuff this time of year because I'm going the wrong direction, but I thought this would be a fun thing to share with all of you, and ooh, that might be blinding. But in any event, it's got the mirror, it's got the powder puff, it's never been used, and that I thought made it really fun. It's got all the little cities and towns listed on it, it's got a dog sled, and I figure that this is something, we've had a lot of interest in compacts in general on live sales on YouTube. Let me get this behind it so maybe it'll show a little more clearly. There we go. And so I thought it would be fun. It even shows Siberia up there in the corner. So I thought it would be fun to try this because this is the time of year that the people who are in Alaska are kind of stuck there. So maybe someone up there will like it or maybe one of our viewers. Now the next piece I have is sitting next to me here and this is a really beautiful coat. This is a cadet's coat from the Citadel. And the Citadel is the Military College of South Carolina. It's quite famous in the States. They graduated a lot of people who fought for the South Carolina in the Civil War. I believe they've been around since long before that. You can see the back here with all the piping in detail. This particular gentleman who had this, he was on the Dean's List in 1962. You can see right here, this is his Dean's List pin. All these bars and medals, of course, have significance. And this is just in college days. This is before you even are to the point of being a military officer, but they get you already getting used to achieving your bars and your stripes and all of that. And I can't tell you, I'm more familiar with American military as opposed to the universities, um, but they are a storied place and there are definitely people who look for those. They usually sell for about $125 and that one I think we're going to do as a fixed price make offer. I think that's an interesting thing and that's something that just came to me. So I thought it would be fun to put it out where the whole world can see it. It's also one of those more specific items. Okay, now we're going to go on to the Blanco. And just because it's a great color that doesn't really go with my chrysanthemum behind me, I just want you to see the color because it's a little more bluish, as you can see there. It's more of a lavender color. This is Blanco Rosé. And Blanco Rosé is a very specific color. 
It came out in 1963 and 64. And the reason they came up with this color, all the glass companies hate making anything this shade of pink because it is very hard on the kilns. There's something in the pink coloration, one of the chemicals that they have to use to get this color really rots out the kiln. So they're reluctant to do it, but Gump's department store in San Francisco approached Blanco and said, we want something proprietary to us. We want a color nobody can get anywhere else. And Blanco had never really done that before, but they thought, well, Gump's is a good customer and we're gonna give that a try. Blanco had always been very egalitarian and let every store sell the same items. Well, lo and behold, they got to the point where they formulated the color, Gumps approved it, and then Gumps changed the terms of the deal and Blanco said, forget it, we're not selling it to you, but we're gonna sell it to all of your competitors. And that's what they did. So between 1963 and 64 only, they made this color basically because they put a lot of investment into making this color and they weren't about to lose that. And so these are the daisy bases. They came in three sizes. There's a single daisy, a double daisy, and a triple. And the strange thing about this, you've got to remember this is the 60s. We're not thinking so much about conserving. We're just making stuff. Well, they would make these by blowing them from the bottom into a mold and then cutting them off for however many daisies. So there'd be a third size daisy that was this big, a two daisy, and a single daisy. Well, the single daisy meant they were throwing a lot of glass away. And so they didn't like making those. So they mainly made twos and threes. And the single ones are actually more valuable than the two and three level daisies when you see these because that's that was what made sense for them. In any event, rosé is a hard color to find. It's the scarcest one of the scarcest Blanco colors. It commands a premium. This piece, which in an amber might be 65 to $85, has a chance of selling for over 100 in this color. I believe that I'm starting it at $49.99, and we're going to see where it goes. And someone might get a great deal, but they're going to get a great base and a great color regardless. I believe that next is going to be this little piece which is the macaw basket. And if I get it there, you can see the color a little bit. This is macaw, which is the northwest tip of Washington State, really the farthest northwest you can go in the continental United States. And at that tip is the macaw Indian reservation. The macaw and the Nootka across the Strait of Juan de Fuca on Vancouver Island in British Columbia are related tribes. The macaw are whalers by tradition, and you usually see either whales or canoes, or in this case, ducks on the outside here. And you can see the top here. It's got some design in it. The little mini baskets are actually some of their most popular, and you can always tell by the cedar planking. See in the middle? That's called planking, the way they weave it there, and then they build out from that. And the other thing about this, you can tell whether it's newer and has the new uh, or aniline dyes because the aniline dyes don't fade. People want the older dyes. Look how much brighter this is inside. This basket is probably 70 years old approximately, and it has faded as it should just with normal exposure to light and that sort of thing. The important thing to collectors is that the design still be visible, and that the condition be good. And the basket is really a very sweet little piece. It should likely sell in the 50 to $75 range, but we're gonna start it out less than that and just see what happens. Okay, our next piece here, I am in some sort of trouble with eBay about selling things related to smoking. There was some sort of a misunderstanding and they do not really uh, like me to put anything related to cigarettes on. Well, this is not related to cigarettes, but I called it a humidor, so I had to change the listing really quickly uh, because they don't want me to sell humidors. But what it really is, is probably to hold gunpowder. This is from the 1930s, and this is chrome, and it says Savage Fox Stevens Sporting Arms, and you can tell that's the guy hunting with his hound. 
that this is Art Deco. It's, I thought, a really neat design. I've never seen this piece before anywhere. I didn't know they made anything like this. Now, Savage and Stevens were not high-end armament producers, but they did make it, and this is why I called it a humidor at first, with a nice wooden liner to absorb moisture. I really do think it was probably for bullets or powder so that it would keep those from getting uh, moisture in them. Now, there is a little bit of surface wear on this, but I bought it anyway because I thought it was a really neat piece with a great graphic and something I had never seen before, and I like to buy things I haven't had before. I believe this is starting at a pretty low price, and we'll just see what happens because I couldn't find anything comparable by any company anywhere. So it'll be a fun new thing, and we'll see if the market agrees or if somebody out there is a collector of such things then it might be fun. It might also be a fun dad gift. Little boxes are always handy for people. Okay, I believe if I am on track here, which I think I am, that our next uh, person up is going to be Madonna. And let's see, I think I probably better take Madonna out of this wrap so that she doesn't glare too badly. There we go, now we can see her. It's funny to think that Madonna items are collectible, but there is an entire category about Madonna on e She's so blonde that she's going completely blonde in this. I really can't get a lot closer because it's very reflective. And the reason it's reflective is the type of material it's printed on. This is a, it's a fabric, but it's also got a gloss behind it. And the reason, of course, was so that you couldn't counterfeit these because this is an after show pass. And it says after show on the bottom. I'm going to cover her face so you can see that a little better. So it's Madonna after show, and this is the uh, Blonde Ambition Tour, where she was at her peak of popularity. It was never used because it was a peel and stick. It's still got the original stick -em on the back. This isn't an expensive item, but I wanted to show you because I wanted to illustrate that things that are pop culture always become collectible eventually. There's a generation who's heard about these people but didn't live with growing up with them, and they're interested and they want to find the ephemera related. Or there's people who that was their growing up years and they loved that celebrity and they really want to collect things related. And, you know, Madonna, the after show, I'm sure that was a show if this thing could talk. Uh, Anyhow, they are not terribly expensive. I think it's starting at $2.99 or something like that, but it's a fun little stocking stuffer for somebody, I figured. And besides, I wanted to do something that was nice and accessible because our next item, well, it is a beautiful thing, and it is absolutely a wonderful item. So wonderful that I'm actually going to do the Dr. Lori treatment and put on my fabric gloves, which I rarely do. Now, I don't know that I need fabric gloves to show you this particular item, but this is one of two items that are very special that are going on as a best offer because they came from... Okay, let's see here. They came from a very high-end collection in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This is a box, and it looks like Capo de Monte. The first thing I want to show you is that they are not having a fun Thanksgiving because someone has come to break up the party. Don't know exactly what the story behind this is, but they were sitting there having a perfectly nice, lovely dinner, and here are all these people have come, and now they're having a battle. The sides are also adorned with scenes on every side. This is Meissen, even though it looks like Capo de Monte style. Capo de Monte was made in Italy. Meissen was made in Germany. But in the 1860s, Capo de Monte was very popular, and Meissen felt compelled to make lines that had some similarity to that because they saw that that was where the interest in the marketplace was. Look at those wonderful angels. Yeah, this is a really, really neat piece, and I'm so excited to get to show you something like this. I can't promise you all have something this great every time that we do these hauls, but I thought you would enjoy this for certain. 
Here's the back side. It's a different scene on every side. Some of them are quite romantic, but a lot of them seem to be battles, and then some of them appear to be the reckoning coming from the sky. It's just a really incredible piece. And then you have crucifixion on this side. So it's a pretty amazing piece. It's got a few things going on with it. The condition is excellent, but it does have a little greening that can be cured. You can clean that on brass. I am not going to make the attempt. I'm going to sell it the way it is. When you open it, importantly, the hinge is in very good condition. That is critical for the value of these. And we can look at the bottom and you'll see the cross sword mark. Now, mice and cross sword marks have been reproduced or faked or put on things that were not mycin, but you can see them there. That is the mark of mycin. I'll try to get up where you can see it a little clearer. So that's the mycin mark with the cross swords. This one is real. I've had one other of these in my career. It sold for $4,200. I believe I'm offering this one uh, under $4,000, but they are just beautiful. And it was very exciting to have something neat to actually be able to show you that is just something really different that you're not going to see every day. I have seen, this one makes number four in 30 years of doing this. And I've worked around some places that had a lot of high-end stuff. So um, they're, they're not common. There's a reason for that price. They're also very heavy. So I'm putting it down now. This is butterfly wing jewelry. But this is a very early piece. This is 1920s, and this is English, done on sterling. There is a sterling mark on the back, very small. It's got a lovely little flower at the attachment. Uh, those are real butterfly wings in the back. Those are blue morpho butterflies from Central America. And the thing that's really special about this butterfly wing we see a lot of good butterfly wing jewelry from the 1940s and 50s, and it's fun and it's cute. It's not usually in sterling silver and what it almost never has. That white in the middle there is a clay. It's called sulfide. And sulfide clay was used to make marbles. It was used to make all sorts of things. But the thing about sulfide is that it also was used to make cameo jewelry. And this is from about 1920. So this is a special piece. It's a little more unusual than your typical butterfly wing. I think that I'm starting it at about what I paid for it, which I think was $25 or $30. They should sell in the $70 to $75, $80 range, typically. So I'll be curious to see what the response to that is. And fortunately, you'll be able to see these pictures on eBay as well. The next item in the lineup is this. I have been showing cameras on a lot of my haul videos and in my show spaces because I've been selling off a huge collection and I'm still working through some of the best ones. This one is a retina, the Kodak retina, and this one is the Retina 1. So this was the very first one that they imported from Germany. Kodak started importing German cameras in the 1930s and then again in the 1950s because the Germans came up with the rangefinder cameras and better lenses than we had had. They came up with the astigmatic lens that took care of astigmatism like people have with their eyes while well, cameras had the same problem and the Germans figured out how to fix that. So this is it, and it's this one is the first one of the generation, so it still stands up like the old cameras with the bellows, but it doesn't really pop out far like they did. Now these can be very valuable depending on the lens. This one is a pretty regular lens, and so it's probably a $40 to $50 camera. If it has a certain type of lens that can uh, focus in from a larger distance. Those can be rather valuable. But what's nice about this one is, in addition to the fact that it's the first one, is that, if we can get them out here, it has all of the owner's guides as well as the original box. So it's a nice package to have all of those things together. And the date on the back actually refers to 1949. This will be a fun piece for somebody who's a camera collector. You can order old film 
you can put film in any camera ever made. It's quite surprising, but there's a place in New York, a place in Seattle, a couple of other places around this country and other film developing places around the world. And you can order film for any obsolete camera, which is really great because a lot of the people who buy these actually enjoy the challenge of doing black and white and art photography using the old silver gelatin for developing and the whole thing and printing and all of that. The next item on my list here are these. And I just think these are fun. These are Friedel Gesch. And this was a company, you can see the label here. I can see one of the labels, there it is. Made in Western Germany. Well, Western Germany, of course, is a mark we see between 1950 and 1990. And these were made in the 1960s, and they came in the late 60s, early 70s, actually. They're just acrylic. They're very lightweight, but they're candlestick holders. And they're very flower power. They came in all sorts of really poppy, psychedelic colors. There's this orange. There's a hot, hot pink. I believe there's a lime green. Uh, they were not playing around. They really wanted the whole late 60s day glow color effect with these and they're a good design people really like these they were inexpensive when new they were usually not taken care of well a lot of times you'll see a lot of wear along the edges or they're cracked or they let the candle burn down and burn the thing so finding these in good shape is actually not that easy anymore it used to be that they were pretty much everywhere and you just found them anywhere you went when you were a picker. I haven't seen them out in the wild in years. So I was really happy to get this set when I was in Seattle. And they are selling for as much as $40 a set now, which is pretty amazing for pieces of plastic. But again, plastic is fantastic if you're buying this era. And acrylic is the lighter cousin to Lucite. So... It, uh, I just think they were a lot of fun, and they stack. So see, there's all sorts of ways you can use them. Speaking of Lucite, the next thing I have, and I'll show this in uh, another video when, where I found it, so I'll leave that a secret, but it was near where this was from. This is a desk set, and it's a pen, and it's a Lucite block, and you think, well, okay, big deal, NCR. Who would care about that unless they worked for NCR? But then we look at what the real appeal of this is. It's unusual to find it as a pen set. What you usually see with these is what you see there where it says Microform the Holy Bible. NCR was one of the per first companies to make microfilm and microfiche in the late 60s and early 70s and this before we got into all of our modern computer storage thing was the best way they knew to store a whole lot of things in a really, really small space. This little piece of film has the entirety of the Holy Bible printed on it and could all be accessed using a microfilm reader. It was a really amazing technology for the time, so much so that a copy of this Holy Bible, this little two inch square piece of film was sent on the Apollo mission to the moon. And because of that, there are a whole lot of people who collect these. There are people who are space race related collectors who like them because of that. There's people who are interested in Bibles who collect it because of that. And then, of course, it's got the office things going for it. And that all in all is what makes this special. Now, I've seen a lot of these for sale that are just a little block with the Bible in it. I have not seen any that have the pen as well. Just the little block with the Bible in it are oftentimes selling for as much as $100. So this is on auction. I didn't start it at a high price, and we'll just see where it goes. But I thought, for novelty's sake at least, it was a really interesting thing, and I wanted to share it with you. So next we have spoons. And I'm going to take them out of their case here. Uh, well, first I'll show you something fun about them. This piece of paper, which came with them and is original, says 100-year guarantee. Now, the paper wasn't guaranteed for 100 years, as you can see, but that means, because these were done in 1933, that these are guaranteed for the plating not to wear off, should the new owner 
want to use them a lot. It's guaranteed for another seven years not to wear away. Well, no, 13 years. Let's do some math. So for 13 more years, these are not going to wear out. But the reason that I got them, and the reason the original owner got them, is because they're a set of four. These are from the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And it's got that really great logo with the big skyscraper and then the picture of Saturn that was stylized. This is right when streamlined design is really becoming a big thing in the United States. And it's also the middle of the Depression, and so people are not buying gold and silver anymore. They are buying things that look like gold and silver. All of a sudden, chrome becomes very popular in the Depression era. And so that's what makes these interesting to me. Um, they are iced teaspoons. I suppose they could be used in parfait as well. But they are iced teaspoons, and they would have, uh, because they would go down in the bottom of your glass. And of course, 1933 is also the last year of prohibition. They couldn't very well call them swizzles or something like that. They had to call them iced teaspoons officially. And that's what they are, and I think they're neat. They're by a company called Deera Gold that was part of the Green Duck Company, and Green Duck apparently did all sorts of that type of pointing back then. And I think those will be popular. World's Fair obviously did very well for me last time, and so I wanted to try a little more World's Fair. And I just think those are really neat. I actually have a set in my own collection. Now, the next item that we have here is this lovely angel. Since Christmas is coming, I wanted to do another item that was kind of holiday-inspired, but she's a little more fun than the run-of-the-mill. I think that you may have seen these before. They're paper mache. They're from Mexico. And they were very popular in the 1970s because they were inexpensive imports. But the thing that was neat about them, a lot of them actually are signed. This one does not have a maker signature that I could find. I'll hold it up if someone out there sees it, then send me a message because I overlooked it. But it does have a hand-painted scene. It's got the cactus and I believe a rabbit there in the desert in front of the mountains. They typically did have scenes on their aprons. The wings are gold. They are attached in the back. They're actually very well made even though they're quite lightweight and they're rather popular now. I was kind of surprised. I got this from a friend of mine. She sold out her old stock and I bought it and she had a price of $28 on this, and it turns out they're selling closer to $40 now. There's a real following for these, apparently. Now, whether it'll sell for that or not, we'll find out, because I am not starting it at that price, and part of the fun of this is that we can all look along and find out how things actually go. And I did notice that uh, someone mentioned, uh, Teofane, one of our viewers, mentioned that there are no female angels in the Bible. I guess that is true. The angels that are named in the Bible are, are male names. And while we're on the kick of Mexican items and things related to religious inspiration... This was another thing that came from that collection that I thought would be fun to show because it is something very different. I've heard people in Mexico call it potencia, but that actually means power. So I think that may be a bit of a misnomer. But what these are are silver crowns. These came out of the mines in Taxco and were made into these items. And these were put on Santos. And Santos are the carved wooden figures that represented various saints. These were done really from the beginning of Spanish influence in the New World. And Santos are very collectible in their own right. And these silver crowns that would adorn them are also very collectible in their own right. Looking at the way this is made, the fact that there's no marks at all. This one only has design on the front side, not so much on the back. And it's just a neat looking piece. If you have a santo who needs a crown, these silver crowns date back to about this particular one, about 1890, and it's a little small for me. 
you know, I got to try things on. Uh, but it is the perfect size for a Santo. And these sell typically in the $125 to $150 range. So I'll be curious to see how that does. It's a very specific market, but there are a lot of people who, if they're interested in collectibles from Latin America, that is one of the things that they really look for, are Santos and things related to them. Now, I believe that the next item is going to be this little table here. And this is nice because it's a little bigger and it'll focus in for us. This is pyrography. And what that is, of course, is wood burning. Pyrography was a very popular home craft around 1900. And this particular one has poppies on it, as you can see, which is a very popular Art Nouveau pattern. These would have been kits sent out and you would make this and put it together yourself. And the nice thing is that we know where this one came from and when because it says right here that it was done in March of 1908 in Portland, Oregon. This has nice design on the legs. They would send you the pieces of wood and a little wood burner and you were supposed to sit around with your family and do this and get the kids involved. I'm sure a few people got some nice scars from that. But they would give you patterns and you'd follow the pattern and then paint it in. And it's absolutely Art Nouveau style. This is actually fairly early. The real heyday for pyrography is really more the teens. So it was interesting for me to see this as early as this. Uh, they were inexpensive. It's lightweight wood. You can see that this one's a little bit curved on the top just from natural aging, but it's actually very sturdy, which is nice. So I thought it would probably be shippable. It's very lightweight. I thought it was cute. It's kind of plant stand size, about 16 inches. And I just thought that that would be something fun and a little different than anything else that I have had listed before. And it's fun to actually be contemplating sending furniture to somebody. One other thing really quickly, I did say I would update a little bit more and I was going to do show two of the items that I sold in the last haul and what they went for on the plus side and two things that didn't go so well. So I'm going to show this next. This is the Weller... This is the Weller Lorbeek Triple Bud Vase from the 1930s. And boy, that really took off. Really fun, cute piece. Went for $175. I was very surprised by that. I honestly thought it would go for about half of that. But they're so hard to find. And that's eBay auctions. You get a couple people who are interested at the same time and they just go to town. Uh, so that was a nice discovery. And very nice because I'm selling that piece for an older fellow who's just had surgery and it couldn't come at a better time. So that was a nice thing to be able to do for him. This is the penultimate item of tonight's listings. And that is this little knob. I wanted to do something small because our last item is kind of big and complicated and involved. So let's look at this first. You can see it's got wonderful stars underneath this acrylic top. This is a speed knob. I drove Studebakers for years, and one of my favorite was a 1949, but it had a gigantic steering wheel, no power steering, and this was something that you had to actually clip onto the steering wheel. And when you did that, then you just turn this, and this would turn with the wheel, and you could turn the entire wheel just holding this and not holding the steering wheel. It was a great invention. It also became illegal in most states. And the reason that it became illegal is because they would, a lot of guys wore French cuffs, and most people wore long sleeves, and most people wore formal things with cuffs. Let's see if we can get that to come in a little better for you. And they would get caught in your cuffs. So if you let go of the wheel and it came back around and got caught on your cuff, it could end up catching you and you could lose control of the car. And so they actually were made illegal in a lot of places, and that's why they stopped doing it. Plus, power steering was invented in the 50s. 
They are legal to have if you have an old enough car, though. And there are a lot of guys who restore cars, who do rat rods, who are a rat rod is where you don't do a full restoration. You just get it to where it runs decently and is sort of a beater and you have fun with it or make it. There's a guy, uh, by the way, named Hot Rods Woodshed who has a YouTube channel and he's rebuilt a 57 Chevy Nomad. This is up in Kentucky. He's become a friend of mine through YouTube and he really uh, has had a lot of fun with it. So if you want to see someone go through the, uh, he took something that was basically half missing and built a car out of it. And that's the type of thing that something like this would go on. Uh, they have been referred to as suicide knobs because it was easy to let go and lose control or get it caught and, and lose control. People do buy these for other reasons, too. Sometimes they'll use them as handles on things. So people will say, I've even, I, I went to one place where the guy was all car crazy and he actually took the backs off these and put them on the wall and used them to hang things on. So um, they're just fun. Uh, the really valuable ones are the ones where you look in and you see a pinup girl or a or a woman who might even be wearing less than a pinup girl. But these are cute and fun, and they usually sell for about $20. So we'll see how that does. I have to say I really, really enjoyed using mine with my Studebaker because it made it so much easier to drive. Everything else about that car was great. It got 27 miles to the gallon, even though it was made in 1949. It was just fantastic. But steering, yeah, that was a little rough. Okay, speaking of rough, I have to not be rough with this very last piece. This is the one that I've been waiting to show you. I've been very excited about getting this out and giving you all a look. So let me get my nice white gloves back on again, because this is one of the few things that I get that really does deserve the white glove treatment. I know that Dr. Lori and some of the other folks uh, who are in high-end appraisals wear white gloves all the time, and I do if we're dealing with paper or fabric or things that are porous. But in this case, I wanted to do it because this has a very large box that I don't want to soil. And we're gonna start with it like this, because from here, it's not very impressive, is it? It's just a gray box. And then we're gonna drop the front and raise the top, and there's an auspicious sign. It says Minton. Minton is one of the best porcelain makers in England. And this particular set is the Queen's Beasts, and I'm gonna rotate it a little bit so you can see them a little better. When the Queen went to her coronation in 1953, there were 10 six-foot statues, and these are their likenesses. The statues were at the entrance of Westminster Abbey when she went for the coronation, and they each represent a different line of her heraldry. Now, this one is the English lion. This one is the red dragon of Wales. And they were done by a famous artist, and his mark is on the bottom. He received an OBE for doing these. His name was, um, well, we'll just read it because it says right there. It was James Woodford, who was from the Royal Academy of the Arts. So the English lion, the Welsh dragon, and the Scottish unicorn. These were the three that were the most popular in the line. And so Minton was smart. They knew that England was not in good financial shape in 1953, and not many people could afford this entire set. And so they made a whole lot of the Scottish, English, and Welsh pieces and sold them individually. Almost nobody bought the entire set because they were expensive when they were new and people didn't have the money. It has the annotation on the box of all of the different pieces that are in it. And there is also a book let me just shut this for a moment. Here's the book, and what the book does is the book actually explains her lineage. And if you open the front, it shows all of her ancestors, Henry's and Edward's and the Plantagenets and the House of Hanover, and this is what the different beasts represent. And so the 10 of them all represent her heraldry. And this book goes to great lengths for those who are royal watchers to talk about heraldry and then illustrate the piece 
and talk about why it was significant. Why this is significant now is because, like I said, they sold very, very few of these complete sets. And I'm going to hold up some individual pieces while I talk about this so you can see them a little more clearly. This one, for example, is the Griffin of Edward III. And the Griffin is quite a stately figure with their wings and the beak. And Minton just does such amazing work. The 24 karat gold painting is all very precise. All of this detail is to look exactly like the original piece as much as possible. This piece belonged to a friend of mine's grandmother. And before I was an appraiser in 1999, I went to visit her. And she suggested that we go to Antiques Roadshow. She was living in Salt Lake City and they were coming. You can see this piece being appraised on reruns of Antiques Roadshow. And they did an update of it in 2014 in July. That's the most recent. And they said that the value had held pretty much consistent. Uh, she picked three items that she thought were very special and told me to pick a fourth one because we could each bring two. And I picked this one out, not knowing, but just thinking that, gosh, it's Mitten and there are 10 of them. That has to be special. And it turned out it was, and it got her on Antiques Roadshow, which turned out to be an amazing experience for me because I got to go backstage while she was in the green room being made up, I got to go watch how they do Antiques Roadshow. I got to watch how they film. I got to watch how they do the backstage research. I got to look at everybody's things before they were on. It was just a wonderful experience. I met the Kino brothers. I met the toy appraiser. And they encouraged me to go to appraisal school. And I am so grateful for this set because this set is the reason I became an appraiser. And so it's very special to me. I kind of hate to see it go, but my friend has reached a point in life. She inherited wonderful things from her grandmother, and she decided that this set, as precious as it was to her grandmother, she said she's kind of afraid of it, and she never puts it out, and that it should go to someone who will appreciate it, and I think someone will. Antiques Roadshow said that the value on this set has in their estimation, remained about the same over the years, which is good because a lot of porcelains have fallen in value, but they said that this set and royalty commemoratives are not as strong as they once were, but this set apparently has really held its value, and they believe, and I believe, that it will sell for somewhere in the $4,500 range. This little critter with all the bumps on him is the Yale of Beaufort. I did not know what a Yale was, but there is a Yale from Beaufort. So we're all edified. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you because it's such a personal story to me and because, well, it's Thanksgiving and I'm very thankful to have something as nice as this to show you and as nice as this to sell for my friend. So it's just been really fun to bring this all to you. This is George the Antique Nomad on Periscope, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And it's great to see you all and bye-bye for now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!